Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Representative Chrissy Houlihan's National Security Town Hall. This is her 73rd town hall since joining Congress. My name is Sarah, and I work for Chrissy in our Washington, D.C. office. During tonight's telephone town hall, Chrissy will introduce two guest speakers to talk about national security and foreign policy issues. If you'd like to ask a question of Chrissy or any of our guests, please press star three, and you'll be connected to one of my colleagues in Westchester, Reading, or Washington. I also see a number of folks tuning in through our website. So as you submit your questions there, please include your first, last name, and town so we know where you are uh, reaching out to us from. For the host herself, Chrissy Houlihan is an Air Force veteran, an engineer, a serial entrepreneur, an educator, and a nonprofit leader. Chrissy represents Pennsylvania's 6th Congressional District, which encompasses Chester County and Southern Berks County. She serves on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on the Intelligence. She is a recipient of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Abraham Lincoln Leadership for America Award, which recognizes members who demonstrate the bipartisan leadership and constructive governing necessary to move our country forward, and the Congressional Management Foundation's 2022 Democracy Award for the Best Constituent Services in Congress. If you're interested in learning more about Chrissy, please head to houlihan.house.gov. So for this evening, our agenda will start off with opening remarks from Chrissy and then panelist introductions as well as a few questions for our panelists. Then we will head to live question and answer, including the online questions or the questions asked over the phone. Lastly, as just a reminder, we will focus our questions on national security and foreign policy for the duration of this town hall. If a member of our team is working on a particular issue for you, such as helping you obtain a passport, or a case with a, a federal agency, please refrain from asking on the status of this call. Instead, please contact our office at houlihan.house.gov or call one of our offices for assistance. With that, I'm proud to introduce our host, U.S. Representative Chrissy Houlihan. Hi, Sarah, and thank you. I'm just confirming that you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, excellent, excellent. So great, and thank you again. And welcome everyone to this, our 73rd town hall. I'm actually right now in the car uh, on my way down to DC, being safely driven, uh, where I am heading down to, uh, as you probably are following in the national news, cast a very, very important vote about our nation's uh, economy and our, our global responsibility uh, to our debts that are owed. Um, I was in our community this today, however, visiting Avon Grove High School where I had lunch with a student, and I also had lunch with a student who made a 1,000 paper cranes. For those of you who were following along, we had a really great uh, crane project where we sent our folded origami cranes to the Peace Memorial in Hiroshima in advance of the G7 summit. Um, and I also was able to uh, be at the manufacturing uh, ribbon cutting in Coatesville today and joining the cutting of the Paiseki Aircraft Corporation's ribbon for their expansion into the former Lockheed Martin Sikorsky helicopter factory located in Coatesville. Uh, many of us had been working very hard to prevent the Sikorsky plant from closing and then were able to pivot to finding a really great, awesome new tenant so those jobs won't be lost and the facility itself will not be vacant. I really couldn't be more proud or more happy to rep, uh, welcome Piasecki Aircraft to Chester County. I'm down here in D.C., or hopefully soon we'll be down in D.C., for the Fiscal Responsibility Act vote, which will reduce federal spending while raising the debt ceiling. And I think that we all can agree, or at least I believe we all can agree, agree that this kind of brinksmanship on drama and drama on really both sides of the aisle is really not a way for us to run our country or our government. So I'm really looking forward to being back in our community tomorrow. So tonight I'll be home, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Washington for votes and tomorrow back uh, in our district to, to be with us in our community. But switching gears to this topic for this evening, I really wanna thank you guys for joining us for a very, very important conversation about national security and foreign policy, which I think is something that frankly doesn't get talked about enough in our communities. So as a veteran who comes from a military family, uh, foreign policy and national security have always been important and personal issues in my home as I was growing up and as an adult as well. And now, of course, as a member of Congress, I'm able to serve uh, on the Armed Services Committee and the House Intelligence Committee, but I've also been fortunate to serve for the last four years on the Foreign Affairs Committee as well. 
uh, where issues of national security um, and foreign affairs are obviously central to what it is that we're working on. So there's really so much that we could talk to about tonight, uh, all the way from the ongoing war in Ukraine to, of course, China's growing influence and rise in the Pacific um, area and in the world to how we manage and handle classified materials at the federal level and much, much more. So I want to make sure that we do talk about what you're interested in talking about. So we're going to go ahead and jump in. So once again, those of you who are joining us a little bit late, thank you so much for joining this, our 73rd town hall. For everyone on the phone, as a reminder, as Sarah mentioned, if you do have a question for us, please press star three if you'd like to ask that question. This will enter you into a queue so a member of my team who is online, also online with us, can can get your question and assist you through that process. Again, for everyone who's streaming on our website, please include your first and last name when you submit your question so we can make sure to also call you back in the event that we're not able for some reason to get to your question tonight. So today I'm really very lucky to be able to be joined by two foreign policy experts and leaders in, uh, in, our, in those fields. I'm being joined by Mr. Andrew Albertson, who's the Executive Director of Foreign Policy for America. Mr. Andrew Albert Albertson is the Founding Executive Director for Foreign Policy for America. He served previously as USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives, or OTI, where he was the Deputy Regional Representative for OTI's program in South and Southwest Afghanistan. Prior to that, Andrew was the Founding Executive Director of the Project on Middle East Democracy, a nonprofit advocacy organization that was dedicated, is dedicated to examining how genuine democracies can be developed in the Middle East and how the U.S. could best support that process. He serves on the board of directors for Secure Families, and he received a bachelor of, uh, I'm sorry, a BA from Taylor University and an, M and an MS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University, where he is or was the Huffington Fellow at the Institute for the Study of D Diplomacy. So we welcome Andrew. Our second awesome, awesome guest is Ms. Liz Schreier, Schreier, who's the president and CEO of the U.S. Global Leader Initiative. Ms. Schreier served as president and CEO of the U.S. Global Leadership Council, or USGLC, a broad-based coalition of over 500 businesses and NGOs that advocate for strong U.S. global leadership throughout, the developing, throughout development and diplomacy. Under her leadership, the USGLC has grown to a nationwide network of advocates in all 50 states, and they boast a bipartisan advisory council that is chaired by, uh, I'm sorry, that, that is, has had virtually every living former Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor Council, consisting of 200 retired three- and four-star generals and admirals. She also has about some badass degrees from the University of Michigan as well. And so those are our panelists, and we welcome them to our conversation. Normally what we do at this point in our town halls is I open up with a couple of questions for each of our panelists that tend to be the kinds of questions that we get asked most from people so that hopefully we'll start the ball rolling and we'll be able to start our really uh, good and vibrant conversation. Reminder, if you have a question, to please hit star three. So my first question is for Andrew. Um, Andrew, as we mentioned, you serve as the Executive Director for the Foreign Policy for America. And in your role, you certainly must observe a lot of hot spots ac across our uh, globe. But if you were to pick one area that keeps you focused or keeps you up at night, could you please potentially tell us what that is? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. I really appreciate the opportunity to join this with you and, and to speak with uh, your constituents. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd say there's a few things. Um, uh, you know, number one on that list for me is, uh, at least over the longer term, is uh, how do we manage our incredibly complex relationship uh, with China? Uh, you know, I, I think about the decades ahead, and um, and uh, you know, number one, we have an in, you know, remarkably intertwined economies. So there's a lot of economic interests to manage. You know, they buy a lot of our products. We buy a lot of products uh, manufactured in China, um, and that you know intertwined nature of our economies uh, really, really hasn't changed that much over the last several years, even as tensions have risen. In fact, it's it's grown. So there's a lot there. 
you know, there's also global challenges that frankly just uh, we can't solve, nobody can really solve on their own. And that includes uh, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, managing, addressing the climate crisis, where, you know, we have to be hopeful that there, there's some amount of cooperation uh, that can be found with China. Um, even though at this present moment, uh, you know, we have been unable to really communicate at all at the highest levels of the Chinese government. That's, that's alarming. And, now, there's a number of issues where, you know, between their human rights abuses at home, they're threatening at Taiwan, where, where we need to push back and, and, and be very forceful and communicate uh, where we disagree with them. But, uh, you know, the other interest that we have, and the other thing that I think we want to avoid is, uh, you know, uh, if we can at all help it, we need to avoid getting into a war with China, because that would be an absolute disaster. Um, and I, I think a lot about the families. Um, who have served in our military uh, and who would be fighting in that war. And, and if there's anything we can do to manage that relationship through diplomacy and avoid a disastrous, costly war, um, you know, we got to do that too. So um, that's probably a mouthful, but, but, but that's certainly at the top of my list is how do we manage that incredibly complex relationship in the years and decades ahead. Yeah, Andrew, I, I feel the same way, and in serving on the Intel Committee and also on the um, Armed Services Committee, it's definitely a conversation that comes up a lot on both committees as well. This Congress, there is a new uh, temporary committee on um, that's focused on our relationship with China, and really importantly, it's a bipartisan uh, committee that was put together by both the speaker and leader, both uh, Speaker McCarthy and Leader uh, Jeffries, and put together with a population of members of Congress who are, are sort of known and identified as being those people who will hopefully be as pragmatic and constructive as possible about just that, which is understanding what the you know rising challenges are with our relationship with China, uh, the possibilities of what's going on in the region that we should be cognizant of, whether they're economic or military or otherwise. Um, but also to your point where we, we want to make sure that things aren't, do not become this self-fulfilling prophecy um, where we inevitably or somehow end up in a conflict um, of some form. But we also want to make sure that we're creating the opportunity for that to be less likely. And you, usually that's the best, um, the best offense on that is a good defense and making sure that we're prepared and equipped. Um, when I was being uh, raised by my family, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a vet, but I'm also a, a child of of a vet, uh, as well as a grandchild of a vet, the DOD, you know, my father would always say the D is for defense, and we don't want to put our men and women in uniform in harm's way. We want to make sure that that's avoided at all costs, but we also want to make sure that we have a forceful uh, and strong presence, both militarily and economically, that would that would uh, prevent prevent that or discourage that from being the case, I guess. Um, and thank you very much for that first question. And Liz, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to you with a uh, question related to your organization. You founded the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition in 1995. USGLC is what some of us know it as. And since then, the USGLC has really been at the forefront of bipartisan advocacy and dis diplomacy. Can you explain a little bit about what brings you to this important work and how it's fulfilled with the work of USGLC? I would. And first, just thank you, Congresswoman, for what you do, for including me. I love being with Andrew, and I'm really excited to talk to your constituents. Uh, not too long ago, I was in Chester County with you. We had a great conversation, but this is fun to do by phone. So we're all about that, that other D, you know, the defense that we have to be engaged in development and diplomacy alongside defense, because sending our, our men and women in uniform uh, into harm's way should be our last resort, as you as a veteran and your family who's given such service know better than anyone. So we're, so we're about talking about why leading globally matters locally. That's what USGLC is all about. And we're really proud to be rooted all over the country, like we are in Pennsylvania, um, honored to be led by our two co-chairs, Patrick Murphy, former Secretary of the Navy, Mark Schweikler, former governor of the state, the great state of Pennsylvania, and, and lots of business leaders and faith leaders, veterans, community leaders, who all believe, just like you were talking about, that America's engagement in the world is so critical, not just because it's the right thing to do, that 
famous Ronald Reagan quote of we should be the shiny city on the hill. But as Andrew started to speak about, and I'm happy to weigh in on China too, is that it's it's the smart thing to do for our security and our economic interests. And we, we can talk about all the reasons why. And I, I think the why is, is very similar to when um, when when we when I was in Chester County with you and we started talking about what is that connection between our engagement in the world and what's happening locally and and I've been hosting with with my colleagues in the organization uh, last year I think about a hundred town hall meetings with your colleagues in the House and the Senate around the country we've done about 30 already since January of this year and the interesting part of those conversations and kind of why I do it is is listening to the American community talking to their member of Congress about these connections so obviously in the in you know a few years ago we were talking about the global pandemic and and how you know our health of our ourselves is so connected to what happens across the world in the Ukraine war and how that impacted our gas prices last summer how the food crisis impacts our grocery prices and what we find is this is an incredible bipartisan space uh, in the last decade there were 50 um, bipartisan bills that passed into law that that were fully bipartisan, that advanced development and diplomacy, that frankly were co-sponsored by everybody from very progressive colleagues of yours to very conservative colleagues of yours. Um, things like advancing the interests of women and girls around the world, uh, helping make sure there's clean water in the world, making sure our foreign assistance is effective, fighting wildlife trafficking, and, and we can talk more and more about issues that are of interest to your constituents, but we're finding that although there are differences certainly, but you know it from your work on originally House Foreign Affairs Committee, your work I'm sure you see in intelligence and armed services now, is that again, there's differences, but that there is a lot of consensus that we need to be engaged in the world our development and diplomacy are important tools to advance even more than ever, especially because we're where Andrew started, because the competition out there is not going anywhere. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, I I um I agree with you. One of the things that I think there were many, many very bad things that resulted from COVID and our exposure and experience with that, I think, you know, will stay with us for a really long time. But one of the things that I was most struck by in our community and in the Commonwealth and country as well was um, our recognition that how how interdependent we are with one another, you know, in our own area, in our own country. But a new realization that we were really very connected to other nations um, and to other people of other nations, not just because of, you know, the spread of disease and germs, but also because of the final kind of understanding of, uh, what were supply chains, as an example? How were they globally intertwined with one another? Those became, I think, lessons of the pandemic and also, as you mentioned, lessons of what is unfolding with our dependence uh, and with, you know, Ukraine being the breadbasket to so many people uh, of, on places like Ukraine. So it's been, I think, a real education for, for me, certainly, as well as our community. I know that when I came into Congress, the number of times I would be asked by our constituents questions that would be global or international and late in nature were very, very limited and very few. Um, now it's a very regular conversation, and I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to have this um, this conversation. I have another question uh, as well for Andrew, and my second question is, we are um, well into a year into the Ukraine um, invasion. What else uh, can you envision or how else? Can you think that we should be um, working with Ukraine or ensuring that Ukraine is protected and can maintain its sovereignty or establish a peace? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. You know, I, I you know, I, I think first and foremost, um, what's going to defend U Ukraine's sovereignty um, is Ukrainians. You know, I, 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 you know, their courage. Their commitment uh, to defending their country has been inspiring, inspired me, I think inspired the world. You know, I think if we think back to the beginning of this invasion, uh, you know, many 
didn't think that Ukrainians would uh, be able to hold up, you know, for days, for weeks. Certainly Vladimir Putin didn't. Um, and and so I, I am inspired by watching their courage. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate that President Biden has said that American troops are not going to go and fight in Ukraine, that this is Ukrainians fight. But uh, at the same time, you know, I, um, I'm thrilled and grateful that we are doing everything we possibly can to support and assist Ukrainians as they are fighting to defend their, their communities, their country. Um, as far as, you know, what, what more can be done, um, you know, I, I think the administration and Congress have done a tremendous job in, in providing uh, each and everything that President Zelensky has, has asked for um, and said the Ukrainians need to defend their country. Um, I also, you know, think it's been quite remarkable the way that our intelligence community has pointed out even, you know, before events have happened, you know, here's what Vladimir Putin is thinking, here's what you might want to expect next. Um, and in that way helped Ukraine, helped our country, helped the whole world um, kind of know in advance what was, what was coming and uh, to rally our allies, and rally our partners around the world uh, to support Ukraine. So, you know, I think, you know, my short answer is, is more of that. Uh, you know, I, I hope that we can just continue and sustain that incredibly important support. I, I will add, um, you know, hopefully there's a moment where we get on the other side of this, um, this war and there's some way to fight, find an end to the fighting. And there's going to be a moment where we have another opportunity to help Ukraine, um, uh, to rebuild, uh, to uh, emerge from this even stronger than they were before. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to support a fellow democracy in that way. And, and uh, I hope we can sustain that support, you know, after the fighting is done. Yeah, I would say that what has, has heartened me in Congress is there is, um, as you guys probably watch the news, there's a lot that we don't agree on down here in Washington as I enter the city limits. Um, but there is um, a really a large center of both Republicans and Democrats who are, you know, united in the understanding that we do need to do what we can to support uh, Ukraine and their sovereignty for their democracy and also for their regional stability that, that they re represent and as well for the global implications of it. Um, I do agree with you that I think we were surprised collectively with the ferocity and um, capability of the Ukrainian um, military. And we are trying to make sure that we're giving Ukraine the equipment and the tools that they're looking for and that they need in a, in a, at a pace and at a clip that helps them to be able to make this a contained and controlled and quick um, war as quick as it we're able to make it. Um, and I think that what I and many of my colleagues across the aisle have been advocating for as recently as last week with uh, the F-16 announcement is that we want to make sure that we're not um, that we're not creating a, a prolonged and endless war, but rather that we're creating and giving the opportunity for Ukraine to be able to defend itself and create a, a lasting peace. And your last point um, is important too. When, if and when we are get to that place where diplomacy and peace um, end up winning, um, we want to make sure that our we are able to help re rebuild, but just as importantly, that all of the allies and coalition that have gotten Ukraine the success that they've gained so far are also part of that solution. Um, so thank you for your awesome answer there. And our last question before we move on to live questions is again for Liz. Um, one of the questions that comes up a ton, um, as you can imagine, both in Washington and in our community itself, is China, our global competition with China. I know that, uh, or I hear that you just returned from Africa and that you were able to see firsthand how sh China is showing up in there, in that con on that <laughs> continent. Couldn't you outline what perhaps you saw and why that matters here at home? And how do we as Americans and America need to show up in the world? I will. I just maybe just one comment about the Ukrainian conversation that you and Andrew were just having. I, I have spent quite a bit of time, as I'm sure you have too, both of you have, with our ambas the ambassador from to the U.S. from Ukraine, uh, a brilliant woman, Ambassador Markarova, and and you know Putin just so miscalculated, not understanding the veracity of of America's 
one of our strongest strengths with both of you coming on, which is alliances, uh, who have been so strong and so impressive. And one of the things I asked her, since I do spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, um, making the points that you both made about why it's so important to our security and our economic interests to be engaged in Ukraine is, is saying, you know, how do we know that the money is being well spent? And, and she was the finance minister before becoming ambassador to the U.S. And one of the things that's so important is for all of us as taxpayers to know you know, there's three inspector generals from the State Department, USAID, and Pentagon that have all spent an enormous amount of time and were very clear that the money again and again has been looked at and have come up with no issues whatsoever of fraud, misuse, or diversion of Ukraine. Um, they're very comfortable with what's happening. And it's why I think when Speaker McCarthy was in Israel and was asked by a Russia journalist, are you supporting Ukraine thinking he was going to say no, he clearly said, no, I vote for aid to Ukraine. I support aid to Ukraine. I do not like what your country, meaning Russia, is doing. So I thought that was interesting for your constituents to know. Now, China. I was just in, uh, in Africa, and the truth is you can see this almost anywhere. My last trip before this trip was to Zambia. And literally, if you've, if for those of you who have ever been to Zambia, I don't know if Congressman you have, you get off the plane and the first thing you see is this very large, brand new, gorgeous airport made by China. And it's, you know, literally you could go where I was in Kenya and Malawi, roads, soccer field, literally the toll booths are made by China and the toll booths look like a Chinese temple. And it's because everywhere you go, they are what one of the guests I was with said are eating our lunch. Their infrastructure projects of their Belt Road initiatives are extraordinary. I did a little research of data before I left for this trip to Kenya and Malawi, and I saw that in the last 10 years, China has increased, this is available data, so I don't know if it's even more than this, but based on develop, uh, available data, they have increased their development investments by 430% in the last 10 years across Africa, Indo-Pacific, Latin America, and beyond. They've increased their public diplomacy investment. This is, again, China's government, the Chinese Communist Party, has skyrocketed by more than 820%. So huge investments, much more than we spent in the entire Marshall Plan in, in real dollars. So you, we're, they're out there. The, qu the question is, you know, why does it matter, you ask? I, I met with Meg Whitman. She was head of eBay and Hewlett Packer. She's now our ambassador to, from the U.S. to Kenya. So pretty savvy on business, I would say. And I asked her the question, you know, why does it matter that we're in Africa, that we're in, in Kenya? And she told me this fact, which I knew I didn't know exactly the fact, but now I know it. I will never forget it. By the year 2050, one out of three workers in the world will be living on the continent of Africa. So China knows that. That's why they're there. So the question is, you know, what do we do about it? So the last thing I would share with you is the difference between my trip before COVID, that's when I got off the plane and saw the airport, and this trip is I saw us there. So the investment that we're making in our development and diplomacy programs are not meeting dollar to dollar, nor do they need to of what Africa is, but they need to be smart investments. And I was really impressed with what I saw. I saw public-private partnerships. I saw investments that were making a difference for America business. Kenya wants to be known as the Silicon Savannah. They want to be a tech country, and I saw programs Happy to talk more about it, but um, I don't think we're investing enough, to be honest, to keep up with the pace. Uh, but that is our future economic partnership, not to mention the security issues that, you know, scare the dickens out of me when I see insecurity like places like Sudan and here, and, and met, I met with AFRICOM and talked about Russia Wagner Group going in, which we can talk about, but there's security ramifications, but China's definitely making an economic play in the developing world. 
Thank you so much, Liz. And yeah, I had the opportunity last summer to go on a bipartisan and bicameral uh, trip with Congress to five different countries in six different days uh, to Africa. Oh my. To see ex- exactly what you're describing. It was a, a whirlwind trip, lots and lots of information. But what I was struck by, same as you, was, uh, as I recall, a bridge that was built by China in Mozambique that had very, very little traffic, but a very, very big bill on it. Um, and the, this is something that we really do need to be aware of, um, our economic relationship with the continent of Africa and all the individual countries, which are very unique in and of themselves, is very, very essential to making sure that we um, give Africa and Africans the opportunities to grow and develop that they deserve and that they need, and that we're providing them the support in order to be um, thriving countries and thriving economies. Um, And so some of the work that I was able to do on the Foreign Affairs Committee last Congress was on the Africa um, uh, subcommittee as well. And I think that that the intersection of Asia and Africa is really fascinating. And our responsibility to be more active on the continent is is pretty evident. Um, And so thank you for that that, uh, insight, really good insight. So with this, we're going to turn over to our live questions or our questions, remember, that are also coming in online. Remember, if you do have something that you want to ask us, star three, remember that we ask that you do ask questions that are related to this subject and this topic. Um, and that you, uh, if you do have a question that is not related to that, that you give our office a call and we'll be happy to answer you. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Sarah at this point in time. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Um, we are going to take it to our first live question um, from Andrew and Redding. And just a reminder, if you're going to be uh, speaking over the phone, just speak as loud as possible because sometimes connection can be spotty. So I'm going to make you live, Andrew, now. Um, can you? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you speak up just a little bit, but we can hear you if you want to ask your question to Chrissy and our guest. Yes, first of all, thank you guys so much. Thank you, um, Congresswoman Houlihan. My question is, uh, how do you view India and our relations with them? Um, Particularly, my understanding is they're more of a neutral power um, where some of their strategic goals on the world stage might align with ours and some might not. And I'm curious how you view that as um, like a third, a third power as we're working or dialoguing or having, you know, um, sort of relations with China. Sure, I'd be happy to take that question um, and, and then we can turn it over to our guests to add color to it. Um, you're right, India is an, an awesome, obviously huge global power and in many cases, geography and, and history tells you a lot about where our nation will sit on the global you know, uh, map and uh, in terms of where they're aligned. And you're not wrong to say that it's complicated in the case of India. But I do think that India is turning its gaze or its eye more westward and less towards Russia, although they do have you know, a complicated relationship, particularly in their um, defense industrial complex with Russia. I had the opportunity to travel to India with the chairman of um, Armed Services last cycle, uh, Chairman Smith, and we were there actually on a supply chain visit to try to focus on um, what was going on uh, and what we could do to be more integrated with uh, some of our defense um, manufacturing with China, with India and as well with Australia. There's increasingly more and more uh, relationships that are that are building in that in that region. And so it was a really interesting set of meetings and had the opportunity to learn a great deal about kind of where India's mindset is on manufacturing and specifically on manufacturing of um, weaponry. Um, and we have some opportunities and things that we should be thinking about there and, and integrating our supply chains better. But I also had the opportunity to visit Hyderabad and to learn more about um, programming and a lot of the other industry that exists in India and how we can work um, more economically um, to make sure that we are uh, good allies or stronger allies. And so all of these things are, as you mentioned, kind of part of the diplomacy and the development efforts that we all have to make to make sure that um, we are are making ourselves as attractive as possible um, in terms of our relationship with uh, places, important places like India. Um, I will turn over the conversation to uh, either of you all, Andrew or Liz, which one of you would like to contribute on that? Andrew, go ahead. Well, 
Well, I, I can just add, you know, I, I appreciate the Congresswoman, your, your answer there. It's a great question. You know, India really is um, a, a pivotal country. Um, it has, you know, a path to history of wanting to be non-aligned. And there's a lot of countries these days that don't want to be sucked into a, a competition between the U.S. and China where they have to pick one or the other. So it, it ends up being a little more complex than that. You know, the, the Indian Prime Minister Modi is coming to Washington, um, I believe, next month um, as, uh, you know, President Biden, I think, is, is, is hoping to, to deepen that relationship. Um, and, and there are, you know, points where we can cooperate and is, you know, the world's largest democracy um, and uh, uh, historically has been, you know, supportive of other, you know, the spread of democracy elsewhere. But, but also, you know, India has um, been a little hesitant to uh, put the same pressure on Russia as, as other countries have. You know, they have a pretty intertwined, um, you know, energy relationship, um, uh, security relationship. And, and so that'll be interesting to see what, what comes. But, uh, but, but agree with the question, you know, that, that they're going to be critical to the future. The, the only thing, Ms. Liz, the only thing I, I would add, I, I was in India on a trip with one of the largest NGOs, um, CARE, for two, for a total of two days, not even, which is not seeing India. It's like going to your district for about um, five minutes, <laughs> given the size and scope. And And I came away probably like you did, Congresswoman, with just the enormity of the complexity of your question, Andrew, is because there, it, it, I just was visiting with one of our, we have a group of 250 retired uh, three and four star military leaders that advise us. And I just met with the chair of our military, one of our co-chairs, Admiral James Stravitas, who uh, a lot of you may know, he's, he's one of the premier strategic thinkers, and he also chairs the Rockefeller Foundation. And we had this, I asked him the exact question you did. And he said, Rockefeller views India as, as perhaps the most important country in the next, de next decade to focus on, even though obviously China is the, the, the country of the moment that we have to focus on. But India, because of what you just heard from the other two, you know, the congressman and other Andrew, is because of the growth of what they mean to our economy, because they play this pivotal question and we don't know which way they're going to go. And so I don't know if we answered your question, but you're right to ask the question. The, the poverty is still high. The economics and technology opportunities are huge. The business opportunities are huge. It kind of has all the complexities that I'm sure we're going to continue to get into today. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah to see if we have any other um, questions. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you, Andrew, for your um, great question. Um, so next up, we have a question from Susan from Moten. I'm going to add you. Um, I'm going to make you live right now. One moment, Susan. Sorry, one second. Susan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Hi, Susan. Ask your question. Hi, Chrissy and Andrew and Liz. Thank you for doing this tonight. Our pleasure. But should I go ahead with my question? Yes, please. Yes, go for it. Okay, I know we're talking kind of international issues, but what is worrying me most right now, this very second, is our border and the fact to me, sorry, my dog just wandered off, um, <laughs> that the thing that concerns me is that we have had millions of people crossing our border. Um, the drugs that are killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, trafficking, it's such a human travesty to the point where our border, our border security guards are committing suicide. So my concern is we need to close this border, and I'm wondering why this is allowed 
I mean, I know why it's allowed to stay open, but I this is huge to me. And also, since Secretary Mayorkas tells us that our border is secure, I'm wondering why impeachment proceedings have not started against him since he is not protecting the citizens of our country. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I really, really appreciate your your question. And I think it's got a lot of really important things to tease apart in terms of, you know, how to approach the, the situation. I do believe that there's a lot of work that needs to be done at our border to make it secure. Um, I do believe that we need to work bipartisanly, collectively to find those solutions and answers. Um, I think it's more complicated than simply the security of the southern border, although I understand why that's so incredibly anxiety provoking. But I also know that we need to do a better job when we have a border solution of forms or sorts, that it also includes comprehensive immigration reform as well. When, and let me describe to you what that means to me, at least. What that means is I really do think there's enough people here in Washington who believe that we have an issue at our southern border and, frankly, at other borders as well that we need to address to make sure that that goods and services cross uh, appropriately and that good people cross back and forth appropriately and that people who are, come into this country have the ability, if they, if they need to declare uh, asylum, uh, because uh, that's a, the nation that we are and that I know that, that you believe our nation to be, that there is a good and diligent process for them to go through for that. But that also, if they just simply would like to come here because they don't want to be where they are, that there is a, a more appropriate process for that, whereby they can apply for any number of the different immigration statuses that we have. And let me give you some examples. We really are struggling in our community right now with labor. We have a very, very low unemployment rate. It's in the low three and something percent. Um, it, the labor issues are for our mushroom farmers and growers and pickers. The, labors, the labor issues are for our high-tech manufacturing you know, we have, as you probably know, QVC is a great example of an organization that has some really um, important uh, jobs available and cannot fill them. And there are many, many of them that are technical, including uh, many manufacturing companies that I've visited as well um, that, that make truck chassis, as an example, or are, are manufacture other goods and services. So we need to be able to figure out a way to not only make sure that we are being thoughtful about how we're bringing people into the country, but that jobs like that are able to be filled by people who would like them. Um, and so right now, I don't think we're doing a good job of striking that balance of sending good resources to our border to be able to make sure that people, as you mentioned, like our border guards and like um, our, our um, customs uh, patrol are, are being able to be well resourced and well supported. But sometimes that means making sure that they have good systems. Sometimes that means that, that making sure that they have enough people. And I'm very supportive of all of those kinds of um, initiatives. But I'm also just as supportive of making sure that we have good pathways for people to be able to come to this country, like my dad did, you know, he was a five year old when he came here, and be able to find, you know, a, a terrific life, a terrific uh, family and a terrific way to contribute to the economy as he did. Um, and so I know it's very, very complicated. I do have hope that in this um, divided Congress, even though it is the majority of uh, right now, the majority is just a few more Republicans than Democrats, as it was the opposite last cycle or last Congress, I still think that that actually creates opportunities for movement. Um, I belong to a couple of different groups where I think this could be a possibility. One is something that's called the Problem Solvers, which is a group of equal Democrats and Republicans. And we are about 60 members strong right now, more, a little bit more than 60. And we work together on these kinds of issues all the time, most recently working on the debt uh, crisis, which we're voting on this evening, and before that on infrastructure. And so I am hopeful that we'll be able to take this one on, um, immigration reform on. Uh, some proposals that have been put forward so far this Congress, in my opinion, have um, 
not been adequate or appropriate. But some things that have been put forward this Congress, I have voted for, as you, as you mentioned, fentanyl. I think the fentanyl crisis is, is horrifying. Um, I want to make sure that we give our law enforcement the tools and equipment that they need and support that they need to be able to stop the flow of fentanyl. Um, and I was supportive of the bills that have been put, put forward this Congress on that. Um, but this is obviously, as you know, and you mentioned, a very complicated process. And I really appreciate you bringing it up because it is an international conversation. Um, I'll go ahead and see if if either of you, Andrew or Liz, would like to comment on this. Um, I'm happy to comment on the international side. I'll, I'll leave it to you on the domestic side, but two thoughts that might be useful um, for a caller. You know, one of the things that we've watched often is I, I, all the research shows is, you know, people largely, we're, we're at a point where we're seeing the largest refugee flow in the, you know, the history of the world, throughout the world. And we're seeing it including in, from Central America and the Northern Triangle. And, and you know, you have to ask, you ask why people leave their homes. And, and in Northern Triangle, you know, there's crime, there's corruption, there's lack of economic opportunity. And one of the key parts of our, our foreign assistance development program is to try to address these issues in a more effective way than what happens at a border. And, and again, I'll leave the border questions and the immigration questions, obviously, to the Congresswoman. But when we spend a minuscule amount of our foreign assistance programs on our own hemisphere, less than you know, about 1% of everything we do in the world, we invest in our, in our Central America portion of the, of the program. And, and when we have invested the most kind of in the mid 2000s, 2015, that area, we saw some real positive impact of bringing down crime, creating economic opportunity. Now, what needs to happen is you've got to have a local government partner to work with, and some governments are better than others. The best example is in Colombia, Plan Colombia, when we saw a narco trafficking country move to now what is a strong trading partner for us. So it, there, there are multiple things that we don't have time on this call to, to go through every element of it, but there is definitely an international foreign policy element of what it, we can be doing to also help relieve the pressure of why people move from one place and are knocking on our door in, a, in too many. The other thing I would point out is you mentioned fentanyl. There is also a foreign policy piece to that puzzle too. Where does it start? It starts and the, the product is made primarily in China. And, and China is not cooperating to say the least. Our State Department um, diplomats are, are upping their game and putting pressure. I just saw a speech by Secretary Blinken in terms of his efforts to try to put pressure uh, even more so. Whether we can be successful with China is a, a big issue, but Andrew started at the very beginning of this, is there's things we've got to get cooperation from China. That is high on our list. Yeah, I, Andrew, I agree with all that. Go ahead. I, yeah, I, I'll just say I don't have a lot to add to those two brilliant answers. Um, I, I'll just, you know, Congresswoman, I, I appreciate the way you, you got after this question because, you know, the, the truth is many of your colleagues, they are sort of, you know, um, playing games with this issue, playing politics on this issue. And, and there's a, there's not a huge number that are as committed as you are to, you know, working across the aisle to solve problems. This is, this is one of those that is going to be, is going to have to take um, some serious dedicated uh, problem solving uh, to really get at the comprehensive uh, solution that we need um, that really does secure our border and, and provide the, um, the, the support and the assistance that we need to um, really resource that effort. And, and also, as Liz, you said, and, and have done such incredible work on um, making sure that we're doing everything we can to help our, our neighbors to the South um, to strengthen their own economies, create opportunities, um, you know, reduce crime and violence so that there's, you know, uh, less incentives um, for, for families to, to want to pick up and move. So, yeah, and you mentioned both of you um, a couple things that are important to to footstomp on. One is um, 
China and its impact uh, and role in fentanyl and it's com- the complexity of manufacturing fentanyl and, you know, kind of, um, I used to teach high school chemistry and, and um, know a little bit uh, here in Congress about the supply chains of what it takes to make and manufacture fentanyl. And the root source is, is definitely an important thing to root out and root and root down. My background as, a, as an engineer is in supply chain management. And so some of the contributions that I'm making in the committees that I serve on has to do with how do we stop the flow of fentanyl in addition to obviously the corruption and crime that is associated with its sale. Um, and if we can find ways to sort of isolate the various ingredients that go into manufacturing of fentanyl um, and the pathways that they get here, we're doing a lot to stop this very, very dangerous and poisonous um, drug. The next thing that I would uh, add to the conversation had to do with um, the importance of helping and supporting um, those countries, uh, you know, the Northern Triangle, as mentioned, and, and South America, Latin America in general. This is a, another place where China is making very big inroads in terms of their ostensible overt support, economic support, and there's sort of less than um, um, uh, kind of forthright support as well and in the background. And we need to be aware that that's happening, you know, literally in our backyard. And this is part of why it's so important to um, resource support into that area so that we can kind of stop problems where they are originating. Um, And I think that's why aid in various forms and diplomacy and uh, diplomatic support and economic support as well is so essential to being able to stop problems at their root. Um, I will stop gabbing now and see if we have any more questions. Sarah, do you have any more questions? Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions, um, and thank you so much for that, Susan. Um, our uh, next and probably final question as we get close to 6 o'clock here is from um, an online question from Lisa from Phoenixville, um, and it's actually um, for Liz, and the question is, how can we help with empowering women and girls across the globe, particularly in developing countries? Um, Liz, if you want to um, you know, give that, give that question a try. Uh, well, thank you for that great question. You know, it is, it is not only one of the most important investments we make in the world, uh, but it is one of the most bipartisan areas in Congress that have really invested quite a bit of time. Um, it was a project of uh, multiple administrations. I actually worked with Ivanka Trump on, in the last administration on what she called WGDP. Um, it was a women economic empowerment program. I had worked with Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, uh, Michelle Obama. I mean, it, it's something that administrations and Congress have really focused on. Because as we probably, uh, a lot of people know, is when you invest in women, they are going to take their economic money that they raise and they invest it back into their families. In the, in the, in, in, uh, the developing world, the, 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 the economic drivers are these small shareholder farmers, which are largely women. Uh, I, I, I visited, the last thing I'll say, and the Congresswoman might, I'm sure, has done this as well and might want to comment on it. I went in Malawi uh, about a week and a half ago in a location because of a cyclone. It took me three and a half hours from my hotel to get there and three and a half hours back, but it was worth every minute of it. Um, very bumpy roads, and I arrived to about 50, 60 singing women, all local farmers, to greet me for a local nutrition program that USAID is supporting, teaching they want to show me so proudly how they were taught about the six healthy food groups, the recipes they made that they were giving to their children. Then they were showing me the garden that they had created, that they now have the ability to not just feed their families, but have enough money to send their children to school. No disrespect to any of the men on the call, but just saying the women were really proud to tell me that story. So we need to invest in women and girls. Congresswoman, you might have something from your travels that you see. I would 100% (laughs) agree with that. It's one of those, you know, truisms that 
um, economic empowerment and education for women and girls is a, the secret sauce for peace and stability and security around the world. And also, interestingly, engaging women in the peace process is also a really good indicator of a lasting peace. And that's not just kind of in things like negotiating peace itself, but also in engaging women in the in security, literally, you know, in uniformed uh, jobs and, and making sure that they're part of the defense of their nation as well. And so these are all good indicators of, a, of an economy or a, or a a country's growth that would would indicate that they're leaning towards or growing towards a more peaceful and stable environment. And peaceful and unstable environments mean that fewer people want to go other places. And so in investing in women and girls, we are investing good money, you know, that's well, well invested so that we end up uh, having it, what we call in the military, be a force multiplier for, you know, making sure that um, our dollar in one place in the, in the world in helping women and girls either with their health or with their education or with any number of uh, ec- economic empowerments will vastly, vastly pay itself back in the things that we don't have to pay for on the back end. Um, and I would be happy to see if Andrew has any input imp- into that. Well, I, 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 I might leave that one to you too as well. I'll just, maybe I'll just say, um, you know, Liz's organization, the U.S. Global Leadership Council, does incredible work. You know, I think every business leader worked to SALT uh, seems to be a part of your, your advisory group, Liz, and, and you're, you're focusing our attention on the power and the value of U.S. leadership in the world. And, and, and partly that's because as the U.S. Has, has played a principled, values-driven leadership role over the last many decades, it's good for our interests. You know, it's good for our economy. Um, you know, it helps – we rallied so many allies and did, you know, help our security, but it's also been good for the world. You know, over the last decades, you know, we've seen health outcomes improve. We've seen education outcomes improve. We've seen, you know, so many, you know, hundreds of millions listed out of poverty. Um, and, and also so many, you know, improved outcomes uh, for women um, in countries around the world. And, um, you know, I, I think that suddenly, this question of how much the U.S. should lead in the world, how much we need to be out front, how much we need to rally other countries and, and be vocal about our values um, is is a point of debate. But uh, I think if we look back and we see all this progress, it's not inevitable, but but we have seen over the last few decades and so many different issues, including um, social progress, equality of women and girls around the world. Um, it, it's just another indicator of the power and value of U.S. global leadership. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And uh, really, really great questions. And I think that we have come to time right now, but I know that uh, I'll turn it back over to Sarah for some final remarks from her. And I know I have some closing remarks I'd like to make as well. Yeah, we are wrapping up. Um, we've had some wonderful questions come in through the chat, so I'm sorry if we didn't have the time to get to them, but please don't hesitate to reach out to our office um, at houlihan.house.gov or give any of our offices in Reading, Westchester, or Washington, D.C. a phone call, and we'd be happy to discuss any of these topics with you. Um, and we encourage you to join us for our next telephone town hall. I'm going to send it back to you, Chrissy, for just some quick closing remarks. Yeah, of course, Sarah, and thank you. And as uh, Sarah mentioned, we sometimes are not able to get to all of your questions, but if you had a specific question that we weren't able to get to, we are committed to giving you a phone call back and to getting you that answer that you deserve. We will do that within the next two business days. And I want to say thank you once again. I really always enjoy um, listening and answering your questions and being a resource uh, and a convener for our community to try to make sure that we can gather the the country's experts on these issues. And that's why I try to make sure that we hold a town hall of one form or another at least once every month. And this, as I mentioned, was the 73rd such thing. Sometimes they are in person and we rotate them around the community so that we can reach everybody. And sometimes they are remote as this one is because that helps people who may or may not be able to be as mobile or, you know, connects more people from all over our community to these phone calls. These telephone town halls are, as I mentioned, just one way that we share resources. And as Sarah mentioned, please don't hesitate to reach out to our offices with all kinds of questions. 
Um, if you'd like to refer back to this conversation, we'll be putting this conversation on our website. And again, that website is houlihan.house.gov. And my last name is spelled a little bit unusually. It's H-O-U-L-A-H-A-N dot house dot gov. I hope that those who've been able to join this call feel like that we have a little bit better uh, understanding of the U.S. and our place in the world and on a global scale and how we can uh, not only protect ourselves from foreign countries and groups who look to harm us, but how also we can be helpful in protecting them and supporting them. Because I think much like COVID, you know, our our health it very much depends on the health of other democracies around the world. I again want to thank our special guest, Andrew Albertson, excuse me, and Liz Schreyer for your insights and your awesome, awesome commitment to these important jobs. Um, until then, until tomorrow when I'm back in our community, please be well, and I hope to see you around. Thanks very much.